It's been two whole years since I last ventured into the world of M. Dickey. Don't know who he is? He's the guy who makes those weird-ass Playmobil games for PC and mobile devices. The last game that we covered from him was the U Testament back when I first started doing this shtick. But did you know that he also made a follow-up game called The Making of a Prophet? That was basically the U Testament, but this time the game was based around the Prophet Muhammad. The game is more or less the same thing as New Testament, feeling more like a total conversion mod than a new game. Most of the environments look or feel the same as New Testament, and you can clearly see what was supposed to be part of the Roman setting when you see the crucifixion and trial scenes. M. Dickey even addressed this, saying, The first port of call when adapting this game for a different setting was to change the landscape. The U Testament's 1st century Palestine had to be transformed into 7th century Arabia. Mercifully, I was able to recycle most of the original locations by simply pulling them out of position and rearranging one or two things. Rather poetically, it turns out that Saudi Arabia's coastline is almost a reverse mirror image of Palestine's coastline. The first biggest change is that the U Testament's 32 separate locations have been trimmed down to just 20, which is actually a good thing here, because it's a case of quality over quantity, and makes exploration less tedious. Of course, some Islamic landmarks also complete the transformation. The centrepiece of the game is the city of Mecca, which houses the ominous black cube known as the Kaaba. I think I said that right. It, it could be Kaba, Kuba, Kaba, Kaba, Kaba Chameleon. I don't know. Anyway, we start this game by creating our character just like in New Testament. I decided to play as Bethany, my daughter from my last playthrough of New Testament, who ended up dying in one of Loz's videos, trying to kill Jesus in revenge of her father. I figured she'd travel through time as a result of her death and would end up in Muhammad's time and place to make a nice little link between these two deep and uh, meaningful stories. We begin at the base of this mountain and as I make my ascent I see Muhammad who has been sitting in a cave for the past few days. I am quite concerned about Muhammad's well-being as he's babbling about seeing a vision of some sort and looks like he's going to pass out. As a result, I coerce him to come back down. Now, believe it or not, Muhammad is actually the most powerful video game character I've ever seen. You see this line about him knowing what we'll say before we say it? This is because Muhammad has hacked the game and thus can do whatever he wants with it. And so, he's actually reading the subtitles. No, really, that's the level we're operating on. It's not even a joke. I usually make those kind of jokes, but no, I'm serious, this is true. It should be noted that it has some sources at the top of the screen, and when I looked at the sources, none of it related to what I was seeing on the screen. Like at all. Maybe it's just my dumb ass not being able to read through the Quran properly, but from the looks of it, I don't see the connection between Saran 96 1 to 8 and the Hadith and what's going on here. Maybe I'm just an idiot though. From what I can tell, M. Dickey has a habit of basing things around a couple of lines, taking two and two and somehow getting 11. I wasn't even aware of this until I started doing some research, but some people believe he actually sees himself as Allah in relation to this game's world, and it would make a lot more sense as to why these things are happening. Like Muhammad being able to hack the game. Things have suddenly just gotten a lot weirder for me. M. Dickey did address some of this, saying that the Knight of Power, during which Muhammad receives his first revelation, was supposed to be an encounter with the angel Gabriel. This was neither possible to display, nor in keeping with the gaming metaphor. Instead, we find Muhammad shaken after being granted a glimpse of the programming and the 3D modelling that has basically constituted his entire world. Jesus fucking Christ. You know, if I if I had a vision from God, and I realised that this was how my world was made, I'd, I'd probably be shocked as well. 
I'd probably be suicidal to be honest. But anyway, he sees his own subtitles on the screen in English and marvels at not knowing what any of it means. This is a riff on the idea that he was famously instructed to read in real life despite being illiterate. What? Anyway, I find some wine and try to drink it but I accidentally give it to Muhammad. So I take it back and he starts lecturing me on stealing. I know I'm a fucking hypocrite for bitching about the toddler snatching in the U Testament. I guess I need to die for that. Muhammad is more or less reskinned Jesus. He says most of Jesus' lines after being provoked and has all of his same powers. I honestly don't know if Muhammad had healing powers in the Quran, like Jesus. I thought he was just a prophet, like a man. Not that I know much about the story of Muhammad, but that was my understanding. Please correct me, I honestly do not know. So we go to what I believe is called the Kaaba, and I have to say, M. Dickey really does it justice. If I had come from thousands of miles away to touch this thing, I would feel humbled. Then I'd probably go mad and start punching the nearest person because they stole a bit of my food. Because I'm in an M. Dickey game. Anyway, no time for the Kaaba now, Muhammad is talking. Listen to me, my brothers. I committed my life to finding the truth, and I have found it indeed. I have seen the things as they really are. I have encountered the God of all gods. You are in error when you worship created things instead of the creator himself. Where is this God of yours that we might worship at his feet? What does he look like? Allah does not look like anything, because he is not one thing, nor is he in any one place. Wait, hold the fuck, is that me? It's me, from the U Testament. What the fuck am I doing here? How convenient, an invisible god that doesn't look like anything and can't be found anywhere. Oh. I'm here to be a dick, apparently. This god of yours is as absent as your brain. Crawl back into the cave that you came from. You are not listening. I saw how this entire world was made. Nothing is as it seems. It turns out that Muhammad isn't the crowd pleaser that he'd hoped to be, but I still think he's cool. I go over and see how he's doing. Interestingly, I'm apparently the leader of a group known as the Quraysh. Y not me in the game, I mean, me, the reincarnate of my U Testament self. Yeah, apparently my reincarnated self has moved up in the world. It's rather obvious that the tribes people, like the ones that I represent, are actually just reskinned Romans from the U Testament. But they're in black robes now, which is cooler, I guess. M. Dickey described it as thus. The game's inhabitants have also changed to complement the new settings. Gone are the Romans that policed the U Testament, and in are the barbarous Quraysh, the tribe that assumed control over Mecca and persecuted the Muslim people. I was sad to see the Romans go, because their distinctive dress worked so well for the unique role that they played. In an effort to make the Quraysh simply more noticeable, they all wear black robes exclusively. This obviously wasn't the case in reality, but I had to turn them into villainous caricatures for the sake of the game. The Muslims, by contrast, tend to wear pure white, except for Muhammad himself, who stands out in a green garb to distinguish himself at a glance. Again, there's no historical basis for this, but such simplistic characterization is essential to a gaming experience. I explained to Muhammad that though he's a nice guy, he sounds like Alex Jones up there. He takes it into account and asks me to go back with him to his wife's port. So Muhammad and I go on a little adventure together. I pick up a sword to protect us both when Quraysh leader Curious says, Oi, Bethany, stop where you are. What are you doing with that sword? Naturally, I tell him to fuck off, only to get the shit kicked out of me. Due to these awful camera angles, I end up getting my ass handed to me every time I start a fight. It's at this point that he tells me to go to bed. 
I tell him to fuck off, you're not my dad. But then I realise that he kind of is, and then I get the shit kicked out of me. Fuck. By this point, I do the awkward shit walk because I'm badly hurt, and I realise that I need some help. That's when this afro dude offers me a spear. Ain't he just the swellest guy in the world? Then King Ezekiel asks if he can have the spear, because he can find a good use for it. Only to then say, I'm sure I can find a good use for it. So you couldn't use it after all. You just wanted it for the sake of it, you prick. I then curse stomp dear old dad to death, only to find out that he's essential. Fuck. I'm then informed that I'm wanted for stealing in Mecca. So now I have to run for it. Damn it, why does this always happen to me? Then I'm immediately arrested for theft and taken to the Roman trial place. As I said, it's exactly the same as the Roman one from the New Testament, and the punishments are also the same. Only this time, Judge Curious is on the case. See how the mighty Koresh look after your people? We've plucked two foul criminals from society. As a further gesture of goodwill at this time, we are willing to release one of them back to you. You know, because if there's one thing that people want, it's criminals being released back into society without charge. Anyway, I managed to get off scot-free because the people are idiots. Hind, the other person on trial, gets her hand cut off. And it's a lot funnier than I thought it would be. We then end up back at the well, where Bethany first met her father in the New Testament. Must have been a lot of work moving it from Israel to Palestine, but I'm sure it was worth it in the end. You might have noticed now that I've not talked much about the game itself. But in truth, I'm not sure what to say. Everything is the same as the New Testament, minus the story and the setting. It has all of the same problems, most noticeably the lack of an in-game map, so you never know where you're going even when you know where you're going. I finally reach Muhammad's house, where someone immediately dies. Very nice. Very nice indeed. So his wife is relieved to see him and insists that due to she and Muhammad living pure existences, Muhammad's story must be 100% true, he could not have hallucinated it. Whatever that means. I mean, I think it means that they don't drink or do drugs, but it's not explained here at all. Apparently, people who abstain from any kind of drug use are immune to hallucinations. Anyway, Muhammad gives his wife a hug and she immediately proceeds to beat the shit out of him with a spear. Yo, don't you go spouse beating my bro, bitch! I give her a much needed swift kick in the JJ. Anyway, to punish me, this dude runs up and hacks my ear off with a sword. Jesus fucking Christ! So, Muhammad tries his shtick again outside the monolith from 2001 A Space Odyssey, and not even Loz or this fabulous pink robe guy can buy into him anymore. Mind your tongue, Muhammad. Do you have any idea how many tourists the Kaaba attracts? It accommodates the 360 belief system. Our society would crumble without the income. My favourite part of the Quran is the bit where I tried to shun the truths of Islam to keep my tourist trap alive. That was the part that really spoke to me. Believe it or not, this whole thing is surprisingly accurate to Surah 25 3-9. The conversation is way more vague than this, obviously, but the basic conflict is kept intact. Mohammed is right. We buried the real god under a mountain of idols. We're harming our own souls. How dare you question the gods of our ancestors? If it was good enough for them, then it's good enough for you. Anyway, this isn't enough to win the crowd over and they beat the shit out of Mohammed. During his ritualistic curb stomping, he gains the epiphany that nobody wants his religion, and he goes home to be with his family. These plans are sort of thwarted on account of his wife kicking the bucket between scenes. Oops. Now, according to M. Dickey, you are the in-story equivalent of Abu Bakr, Muhammad's son-in-law. 
He's been written out of the story so that you can have his place. Muhammad was also discovered by his wife on the mountain and took years to talk about his experience. But M. Dickey decided he wanted to change that to make it a much easier to digest story for the game. Because Bethany is a dick, like her dad, she chooses now as a great opportunity to chastise him about the fact that God didn't save her. Not really the time, Bethers. Muhammad goes on to say that suffering is a test that needs to be passed in order to strengthen your resolve. He decides to embrace his suffering whilst burying his wife. Now I make my way over to the mountain where I met Muhammad, and at this point there's something I need to address that I didn't address in the U Testament. The health bar. The health bar is really confusing in this game, as green equals bad, and grey equals good. It's like every other health bar in every other game ever, but it's inverted and it makes absolutely no fucking sense. This meant that I died, but because this was a sucky death, I quit the game and crashed it on purpose to stop the game from erasing my save data. Take that! I then ask Muhammad why I've been dragged up this mountain, and he informs me that it's not as it seems, as he removes every texture from the world so he can only see wire mesh. The fuck? Remember when I said that Muhammad can break the fourth wall? Well, this is the most blatant example. This just got too meta for me. So after taking that fucking shit in, I find Muhammad on the floor like a beggar and chastise him for it. You won't catch me sitting on the floor like a oh god damn it. So Muhammad goes on a tangent and I'm distracted by the fact that Allah is referred to as a she. This again. It confuses the hell out of me. This was the case in the New Testament, and I honestly don't get what M. Dickey is trying to do with it. Unlike the Christian God, Allah is considered gender neutral. I've only just found this out myself after a bit of research for the episode, but as said before in this very game, Allah looks like nothing established on Earth. He'd probably be both genders or completely asexual, or possibly a third gender that hasn't even been identified by man. I'm not talking about self-assigned genders, by the way. I'm talking, like, naturally. Like a third option, where the gender wouldn't be male or female on a biological level. Before, my theory was that he believed in God the Mother as a concept, celebrated by the World Mission Society of God and one or two other religions. However, here, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if it was a typo, because it doesn't make sense otherwise. It also could be explained by the fact that M. Dickey kind of hops around from religion to religion, taking what he wants from each one and using it to make his own hybrid sort of religion, from what I gather anyway, so it doesn't really surprise me that he had his own interpretation as to what God is and tried to subtly slide it into his games. Unfortunately, I doubt we'll ever know because I'm not even sure that M. Dickey himself knows what he's doing with this. Allah teaches me the ways of the Force like Jesus tried to. Again, I have no fucking clue how the magic system works in this game. I did find my magic talent tree, but could do nothing with it, so... Progress? After meditating for a while, my hands burst into flames. I really wish that I smoked because this would be very useful. When I try to pray, this idiot constantly comes over and basically questions you about being a Muslim. And eventually, they do it regardless if you're praying or not. Who are you, Jada Franson? Fuck off! I then encounter this slave owner who has tried beating his slave for an hour and can't get him to do any work. You'd think that maybe not hacking off his limbs would help, but nah. The slave owner tells me that he'll only release the slave for some money. We've got to have money. How much money? Ah, one bag of gold will do. Who the fuck is this guy? The mayor from the Christmas tree? So, I find a sack of money on the floor, as you do, and I bring it back. Wait, doesn't that make money completely worthless in this universe? If sacks of it are just discarded on the streets and nobody takes it, then it has no worth. 
and bags of it are just left around in every part of the map, so what is the point? Well, apparently one money bag is worth more than a single slave, so he takes it, despite the fact that he could have had both, if he'd walked around enough to actually find a money bag, and then he fucks off. Muhammad then confronts me about my missing ear, and like the super cool dude that he is, he restores it. Whoa, you're the best, Muhammad. You're my number one guy. No, really, I like Muhammad. He's more useful than Jesus at this point. Then I encounter this wife-beating piece of shit who believes that men are stronger than women and should therefore be able to beat the shit out of them. Muhammad not only schools the fat wanker, but he also casts a spell on him that makes his balls shrink or something. He says that it makes him weaker, but I just like to imagine that it shrank his balls or made him permanently flaccid for the rest of his life. It, it, it's just a funnier image to me. The woman is thankful and joins me and Muhammad on our badass road trip of badassery. Then I proceed to beat the shit out of the fat misogynistic wanker with a pipe, the pipe that he gave me no less, but unfortunately that gets me ran out of town. Then this guy asks if I'm a Muslim, to which I answer yes, and then he tries to have me run out of town. Misogynists are okay in this town, but Muslims can fuck right off apparently. Why does that sound familiar? They give up pretty quickly after a while, but I begin to hate everyone so much that stabbing them doesn't seem worth it, it almost seems crueler to let them live. I do manage to nearly stab this alamophobic douchebag to near death, but it turns out he's essential. For fuck's sake. However, I do make him cry. Good justice. I then arrive at the crucifixion fields. Yes, there's one of those in the game. I wanted to point out, thanks to this guy, Darren, on the Let's Play archive, I found out that INRI, which has been stapled to every cross in the game, is a message specifically for Jesus' cross, which reads, Here's Jesus, King of the Jews. Paraphrasing, of course. How and why this is a thing in the Prophet of Muhammad is beyond me. Like, it would have taken literal seconds to cover that up. I guess all these guys were the king of the Jews. Muhammad then encounters a guy beating his kid because he can't afford to feed him and keep him clothed, and so he decided to beat him to death in the middle of a place of execution. I guess adoption wasn't an option. Brilliant idea. Muhammad decides to play Honey I Shrunk the Asshole and more or less flips the tables. In case you're wondering, there's nothing that says anything about this in the Quran. Cited on the, you know the passage, cited on the screen, that's supposed to link to this scene. It has nothing to do with this. I'm a bit disappointed. I was looking forward to reading the Quran passage where somebody got shrunk and a child became a giant, but sadly this didn't happen. I'm really disappointed, guys. Anyway, I then take advantage of this and beat the shit out of the abusive dad. I mean, why not? It's what he's there for. Muhammad then reveals himself to be a predator because now he can go invisible. Cool. He tells me that he's been spying on people whilst invisible. Um, that's not cool, man. You know there's privacy laws and shit that you're violating here? You can get in serious trouble if you're caught. Anyway, Muhammad goes on to tell everyone that he's not happy with what he's seen, whilst perving on the general populace and starts ranting about the Day of Judgment. I guess he's given up on that whole sane and rational thing that's so overrated nowadays. One thing that you might notice is that this game has the exact same soundtrack as the U Testament. Somehow, it never gets old to me. I gotta give it credit that for a game that only has four soundtrack, it never manages to frustrate me. But maybe that's just me. I like this guy in the crowd who's lost his eye and his wife gives his knob a rub. For some reason, I don't know. Muhammad then kickstarts his cult and gives us all matching white robes. He still wears green, so he stands out apparently. Because, you know, he couldn't wear white robes with a gold sash on them or anything like that. I also like how this guy brings a cross to the club. Pretty sure he'll be very disappointed when we don't actually crucify anyone. 
Then this guy asked me to join me in prayer, but it's obvious that he really just wants to perv on me by staring at my ass. There's always fucking one, isn't there? Hell, this guy's so excited at the prospect of ass that he throws his sword away and rushes to check, and perv number one just looks up approvingly. Oh shit, dude, Muhammad's coming! Uh, I ain't looking at ass, Mr. Muhammad. I, I swear, I I'm doing my prayers. We then go to this village where Muhammad learns the greatest of lessons. That children are little shits. This chavy skinhead kid declares that he's a trickster. Oh, that Muhammad, such a prankster. He then declares open season on Muhammad throwing stones at him. What the fuck is this? Britain first Palestinian battalion. What the fuck's even going on? I like how the first brick thrown hits this kid in the head. Brilliant. Fucking brilliant. Then Muhammad gets the shit kicked out of him. I try stepping in to save him, but this happens. <laughs> Holy shit. What the fuck? <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. What kind of rocks are these? So, yeah, I lost an arm. Not as bad as this dude who lost a leg, but at least he's coping with it alright. So, whilst the little shit has beat up Muhammad, I get my strength back only to realise that I can't pick anything up. I try beating up the nearest brat but end up falling over. Shit. So, Muhammad is beaten to death multiple times and even Cross Guy's son gets in on the action. I decide to leave knowing that I'll never survive a fight in this condition, so might as well live on to fight another day. Then this yellow girl starts doing knife gestures, which isn't creepy at all. Anyway, I try to shamble my way to the next area, but it takes ages, and my mental and physical health is deteriorating rapidly. It doesn't take long for me to go insane and attack the nearest guard. The guard then arrests the mutilated insane woman and deems her fit for trial. I mean... I know that these guys had a harsh law system, but surely there's got to be some standard. Surely. I know that I'm not going to do too well now because I'm up against Aristotle, and somehow I don't think that I could ever be as popular as him. And so I'm sentenced to crucifixion, despite only having one arm. How does that work? <laughs> And so Bethany is left, with only one arm and virtually no mind left, where she will eventually die on the cross. Like her father before her, she died a martyr to her cause. I know that I could have saved myself from this just by dragging myself off of the cross by praying, but it just felt like the perfect end to my journey. Bethany dies and Muhammad goes on to found the religion of Islam. I'm not too mad at Muhammad this time, unlike Jesus, because he was getting the shit kicked out of him by a bunch of little kids, so I guess he had an excuse. I knew that he would have helped me if he could, because Muhammad is a much better homie than Jesus. Either way. So, that was the making of a prophet, and yes, it's more of the same. I was going to say that the religion is treated with respect here, and in a sense, I still hold that belief. Given that a lot of the inaccuracies are intentionally put in the game, several of the morally questionable bits are cherry-picked out of this game from what I understand, and some metaphors were made real and grossly oversimplified and exaggerated. I didn't do much exploring of this, in the New Testament, but here it comes up more often whilst looking into the game. Some scenes are worse than others in this, and overall I wouldn't say that it's the best depiction of the Muhammad story. I do, however, find it fun to play. Though this might be the most blasphemous statement here, I can't help but find M. Dickey's games charming. The way that they look and the way that the characters act is bound to get a few laughs out of anyone. I personally have little investment in the religious side of these games, because I'm not religious at all, 
I will say though that anyone who liked the U Testament will find this equally as fun. It's got a lot of the same qualities as that game and more or less feels like an expansion. Which is kind of wrong considering that Islam is its own religion, but fuck it, it's the world of Mdiki. I feel like Mdiki is a passionate guy who has a raging stiffy for himself and isn't the sharpest bowling ball in the shed. He talks about his games like they're high art, and I really don't think he's kidding. Like, he talks about a few of them like he's a true innovator. I honestly think he did go towards this game with the same respect that he gave to the New Testament. Whether or not that's a good thing is debatable, but I do think he had some good intentions in mind with this. If it comes across as insulting to some people, I would like to remind you that Christianity didn't exactly get a better makeup here either. Mdiki tried, I guess. What can I say? As far as him being a, an artist and a true innovator goes, I personally don't see it, but a lot of people don't see it when a genius lives in their time. Who knows? Maybe he could be the Van Gogh of game developers. <laughs> I hope he is. Oh, I seriously do. I hope people are revering this game in like 50 years time. Because I love it. Time for you to face justice, me! Mohammed is right. We've very good on. Uh, Mohammed is right. We've very the real good on. Uh, I... <laughs> Mohammed is right. We've very the real good under a mountain of idols. We're home. Uh, I... <laughs> Mohammed is right. We've very the real good under a mountain of idols. We're home. You are not listening! I saw how this entire world was made! Nothing is as it seems! I'm really channeling some Clint Howard there, aren't I? We will take action if and when I authorize it. If and when I authorize it!